I was very keen on really fleshing out Superman's early stages of his journey first. We had Man of Steel, and then we went quite a bit darker with Batman v Superman. And if he were to uh, succumb to the anti-life equation and become bad Superman, I really wanted to make sure that we saw the hero, Superman, and we saw the, the, the true symbol of hope, the, the, the beacon of light, before we went down the path of darkness and then redemption. And still something that I am very keen to flesh out. Man of Steel. The wonderful thing about Man of Steel and what Snyder and Nolan and, and I wanted to do with, with Superman was create a Superman who was accessible in the sense that what would we do if we lived in a world where we had to keep every single aspect of ourselves hidden and we couldn't really truly interact with people and how would that affect us. It's especially when you have that scene with Kevin Costner who's who's saying, look, don't, don't reveal yourself. The world is not ready for you yet. And it'll only only be a bad thing. Clark does follow that, that advice at first, but then realizes that's not the way to go and that he must do what he must do regardless of that advice. And that was the beautiful bit is that even though he has restrained himself and lived this life of, of, of loneliness, essentially, he's still willing to step out of the shadows and become the hero despite the fact that it's gonna have a negative impact on his life. And that I think is, the aspect of that symbol of hope. It's, he's representing everything that is good about mankind, despite the fact that mankind may not be good to him. Don't do this! Stop! At the end of Man of Steel, it was set up so wonderfully to, to begin that journey because he had had his first outing against the last member, surviving member of his species and had to kill him. And that is going to inform a lot of who he becomes. The terrible destruction of Metropolis, where he's fighting a, someone who has the same powers of him, but actually has training. He barely makes it out of that thing alive. And so what lessons has he learned? He definitely isn't gonna kill anymore. And he's definitely going to make sure that population centers are completely removed from the equation because now he's experienced it and now he's thinking about it. And so we get those steps towards building that, that incredible uh, wise version of Superman rather than the, you know, still wet behind the ears kind. The Witcher. The life of an actor can be very isolated. I'm, I'm, I tend to be a reasonably private person. And so when it comes to playing Geralt, I was no stranger to the idea of, of being the, the, the solo nomad-like uh, traveler and going from place to place. That's something I've been doing for 21 years now. And so that aspect of Geralt was definitely easier to tap into. That's not how it happened. Where's your newfound respect? Respect doesn't make history. Toss a coin to your witcher, whole oh, valley of plenty. I think with, with season two of The Witcher, my focus mainly lay with, with making sure that the Geralt of Rivia from the books was really shining through in my performance in the show. When I say run, you run. When I say hide, we have to stay. You hide. Run! In season one, 
there was a deliberate choice of mine to be less verbose because I didn't have the luxury of the show being dedicated purely to Geralt. And so you don't have that swathes of, of nuance and complex dialogue, which you have in the books. And so I thought, okay, how do I reflect Geralt's intelligence and his wisdom? And I figured if I actually do the man who listens more and watches more, and sometimes for some light comedic moments makes a judgmental noise or two when someone's finished waffling or pontificating, then it might represent the character a little better. The advantage of going into season two is that I actually wanted to make sure that that book Geralt shined through a bit more, especially now that we have him in a personal environment. He's with Cirilla, who becomes his ward and ultimately a, a daughter-like figure to him. And then we're with his, his witcher kin and, and his father-like figure in Vesemir. And so at that stage, he doesn't have to have the walls up. He doesn't have to be so closed off. And I wanted to really reach into it and just make sure that he had a, a more expanded vocabulary and that he sounded more intelligent and that he came across as someone who had the wisdom of uh, between 70 and 90 years. For me, that was the real focal point of, of season two. I, didn't, I don't think I found any moments where I was like, aha, I found a little deeper level to Geralt. It was more about making sure that that part of the books lived in the show. Mission Impossible Fallout. That was, I mean, firstly, an amazing movie to work on. Uh, such a good fortune to work with the likes of Chris McQuarrie and Tom Cruise and, and everyone on that. It was uh, Rob Hardy, everyone, the DP that is. And I was counting my lucky stars every day. That's not what this is about. Sure it is. I know you don't want me on this detail, but let's face it. If you'd made the hard choice from Berlin, I wouldn't be here. If you hadn't gunned down the syndicate agent they sent you to find, I wouldn't be here. That's right, I know all about you. You're why we don't have a living witness who can identify John Mark or the Apostles. If you have a problem with my methods, you can always stay behind. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, isn't that the thing? Some of the days that I was not quite counting as many lucky stars as others was the helicopter sequence. Now, I loved it. I thought it was a lot of fun. But because I'm in a helicopter with the doors open above the mountains of New Zealand in winter, it's particularly cold. It took two, three weeks, maybe four weeks to shoot that. And so that's four weeks of me hanging outside a helicopter with my head in the wind. And I'm firing real blanks, and so it's not, it's not like CGI stuff added. So I'm having blank residue flying everywhere. I can't hear anything because my headset's not working. I'm just waiting for the pilot to scream something and give a signal. I'm like, I think he means rolling. We're moving, so maybe he means rolling. I'm just gonna stick my head out the window and, and start acting, and maybe we're catching something. That was probably the most difficult bit, but at the same time, the most thrilling, because you're in a scene with an actor and a producer as dedicated as Tom Cruise, who's learned how to stunt fly a helicopter in the mountains, which is a very different thing. Mountains are, are very difficult for helicopters. And you can see the whites of his eyes in the helicopter behind you as you're being chased. You're pretending to fire this huge machine gun at him. It's everyone so happy at the end of each day, and it's genuinely exciting. And then at the end of each day, I'm sitting on the skid of this helicopter, looking out across the ocean off New Zealand, above a glacier, and people don't get to do that. That was something which is uh, you know, once in a lifetime experience. And as much as it was a touch on the chilly side, it was an experience which I, I would not change for anything. Enough games, I'll take you out of here. Where's Hunt? He's gone to the meeting with a copy of you. Calm down. Call me apostles. One. I have no way of contacting them. For their safety and mine. What I do have is an extraction team with satellite overwatch and a prearranged rendezvous. I'll know as soon as we leave the building. Enola Holmes. The funny thing about approaching characters with as long a history as, say, Sherlock Holmes, is that I don't approach it deliberately with the intention to make it my own. I look at how it's been played before and I had the very good fortune of working with Harry Bradbeer and the character has been done so well before 
and it's all the the classic uh, direct adaptations of the source material have been done so wonderfully that it actually allowed me room to to not necessarily do things precisely as the books have done before. I have never seen such a range of romances in my life. It's enough to turn you to newspapers. What in heavens are you looking for? Why might you be interested in the personals? You've gone quite mad. I have a right to be mad in a place like this. I was forced into calligraphy as a child. Ah. Hated it. But there's really a case where someone's handwriting doesn't tell me something I need to know. And what might I learn from deportment? The way a person stands may disguise who they are. Because this is a story about Enola and Sherlock is a player within that story, I wanted to make sure that it was supporting Enola's story more than anything else. And to play Sherlock in the way I played it was, that was the intention always. It was always to make sure that uh, Enola was the focus and that it was a, a character who uh, would do nothing but highlight all of Enola's wonderfully positive traits. And we could tie back little family ties here and there, similarities, because ultimately Enola and Sherlock become, become quite a pair because they do have some, some real similarities in there. Enola. My God. Look at you. You're in such a mess. Where's your hat and your gloves? Well, I have a hat. It just makes my head itch. And I have no gloves. She has no gloves. Plainly not my dropped. The man from Uncle. Guy, Richie, and I had plenty of conversations before we started shooting Man from Uncle. And the wonderful thing about Guy is that he is very much a creator, he's very much a collaborator. And so we would literally sit in his house and talk through scenes and throw ideas around and, and it was always an open playing field. And he was very honest, he would say, that's a terrible idea, we're never doing that. Or he would say, you know what, that's way better than my idea and I'm kind of embarrassed. Uh, so let's put that in. Or he'd come back, we'd come back the next day and say, you know, I said it was a terrible idea. I've thought about it. It's not a terrible idea. It's actually a really good idea. We would work and manipulate this character and we'd find the best way of doing things. And so as much as Robert Vaughan did an amazing job, it was, we wanted to make this, this our own. And, and Guy has such a particular style and he's such a wonderful director to work with. I felt like I was in very, very safe hands there. And so uh, no matter what we did, it was going to be, he was going to create something cool and we were going to do it together. I'll let you tag along, but it's in and out, no mess, so nobody knows we've been here. And we both forget about in the morning. Okay. What is that? Super hardened boron sharpened with a CO2 laser. Hmm. CO2 laser. Immortals. It wasn't as challenging as, as one may think working on a green screen. Of course, Tarsem was very generous and he had lots of artwork to show us and would say, like, this is, this is what you're looking at, basically, if we were looking off uh, a cliff top into an expanse beyond. It definitely was a great introduction because later in my career, I ended up working in pure green screen rooms and that's a bit uh, discombobulating. When it came to Immortals, it was a good warm up for the rest of it. The Tudors. While playing Charles Brandon, I had the really good fortune of the creator of the show and the writer being Michael Hurst. Michael Hurst is very, very talented and would always dive and delve deep into the history of all these characters to find the most interesting tidbits. And, and sometimes he would combine characters, otherwise there'd be too many Marys, Margarets and Elizabeths to, to kind of make sense of a TV show. It's really hard to find material on Charles Brandon. I've looked and he said, yeah, Charles Brandon is, is a tough one to find, to find stuff on. And so he took what little he had, um, what little you could find in history and really expanded upon it. It was such a pleasure having him write that character because he was, it was almost like he was bringing the character to life. I gave Michael a gift at the end of the show 
saying if Charles Brandon were alive, he would, today, he would thank you. Your Grace. Uh, what do you want? Only to pass on His Majesty's love. He appreciates the role you will play at my Lord Buckingham's trial. And for all the care you have for His Majesty's well-being. He also sends you this. So for me, it was using what came off the page, really. It was one of those uh, pleasurable experiences of not having to really work against what's on the page or build it up into something else. Michael had done so much of the work there. The Count of Monte Cristo. I was 17 years old, uh, playing 16, which at the time was a big difference, obviously, but for anyone our age now, not so much. Several of my friends are going to Rome for two weeks during Carnival. I'd like to accompany them. Rome? And no chaperones. I'm about you only 15. Almost 16. Make my birthday present, Father. So I was in boarding school in England. I met with Priscilla John, who was a casting director. She was so supportive and she really sort of helped, helped me get the role, really. When it came to meeting with the director, Kevin Reynolds, it was a huge event for me because I was shortlisted for this movie. At 17 years old, that's a massive deal, especially if you want to become an actor. And you haven't really seen the outside world that much. You haven't been you know, around London all the time because I'm, I'm a kid from Jersey. It's a tiny island in, in between England and France. And when I'm not in Jersey, I'm in the walls of my boarding school. And so to have this, this the world kind of reach in and, and start investigating who I was was a, a very, very exciting thing. <laughs> And then I had to have the conversation with my parents about the last year of my schooling. And I said, well, what do I do? And they said, look, you've always wanted to become an actor, you know, go for it, see what happens. If it all falls apart, if it fails, you can go back to school, you can get your A-levels, but otherwise, run with the ball. And so I did, and here I am now. The only way one can play a character who is so intelligent that he can dissect every other character before they have a chance to speak is a fantastic writer. It's all up to the writer, it's all up to the director. An actor can do whatever they want, but if it's not on the page and it's not in the scene already and, it's not, and the director isn't able to, able to pick it up and the editor isn't able to put it together, then there's no hope for that character to look that intelligent. And so it's all down to the amazing ability of Jack Thorne, Harry Bradbeer and the editors.